Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church on Wednesday night. And we got a bunch of people in the house, got some new people in the house. And we got people online right now across the country and Radio by Grace across the country. And I think we need to hear from the Lord. I need to hear from my Lord. And if Jesus is your Lord, then I'm going to say you need to hear from your Lord. And I'm really excited about the sermon tonight. It's going to rock all of our worlds. But I've decided, instead of you getting all nervous and squirmy and not liking what's going on with the message, I just thought, well, I'll just jump right to the ending. Is that okay? Because if I tell you the ending, then when you get all squirmy and nervous and like, I don't know if I like this, well, you already know where it's going to end. Because tonight what we're going to talk about from the Bible, actually from Second Chronicles 26, we're going to talk about peace and prosperity. We could talk about hell and destruction. <laughs> well, I know, I know, you're, you're almost afraid to say when I say peace and prosperity, you're afraid to say amen, because how many times have I told you I'm not part of the prosperity gospel? I'm just not. You know, where you name it and claim it, and then you have perfect health and wealth and everything you praise with a yes. And there's a rainbow over your house. People just hand you money. Your doctor says you're growing hair again and teeth. You don't need glasses. <clears throat> I, I don't believe in that kind of prosperity. I believe that God's going to prosper your life according to what the Bible says if you know Jesus. So since the title of the sermon is Peace and Prosperity, and can't we just confess before we get in, we, we look at everything and everyone else to try to give us peace and prosperity by the world's definition. And we agree a lot of times with the world's definition. Where Jesus comes along, and then he has a whole new paradigm. He has a whole new way of looking at peace and prosperity. So remember with me, I'm giving you the punchline at the end of the sermon, okay? And you say, why? Well, in case you get mad enough to leave, well, at least you know what I mean by peace and prosperity. Is that, is that cool? Yeah. By the way, peace is a person. And we're learning this going through John's gospel. And we were just there, John chapter 14. So take your Bible with me, and I'm going to start in the gospel of John chapter 14. And we'll just jump to verse 25. We saw this two months ago. That's on page 1324 of a Bible right there in front of you. Make sure there again that I'm quoting Jesus accurately. Make sure in Second Chronicles I'm walking through the chapter verse by verse. Make sure I'm not making it say something it doesn't say. Make sure. Because a lot of people want to trick you with the Bible. I just want to communicate the Bible it's not my message, but when you talk about peace, well, you got to talk about Jesus because Jesus is the one in chapter 14, verse 25, Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you. He's talking to the boys, the upper room, but the helper, can I hear you say helper? helper. Now we know that's the Holy Spirit. That's the paraclete. That's the one called alongside the advocate, the counselor, the comforter. But when the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he, the helper of the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Matter of fact, the peace he gives us with the Holy Spirit, his peace, his peace, God's peace. We have peace with God. We also have the peace of God. 
You understand the difference, right? I'm not fighting God anymore. Jesus Christ paid the price. He is my peacemaker between me and God the Father. But I also have his peace. I have the peace of God. Translate it. It doesn't matter what happens. If I have peace with God and the peace of God, I've got peace. Whoever runs the world, whatever Russia does, doesn't mean I like it, but I still got peace. Whatever my doctor says, <laughs> whatever my banker says, whatever my wife says, whatever my kids say, whatever you say, I, I already have peace with God and the peace of God. I have Christ's perfect peace because Jesus is my peace. I have his peace. Amen? Amen? So when we're walking through the sermon, and we're going to discover people that are looking for peace in other places, you'll already know what I mean by our peace is the Lord himself. And I need to remind myself, in a world that's full of everything but not peace, they might be saying they're looking for that, but they're looking in all the wrong places. And before I go too much further, I do care what Russia does. I do care about the Ukrainians. I do care about Israel. I do care about Canada. And I do care about our president. And I do care about our country. And I care a lot about Amarillo by morning. I do. But all of that's secondary to the peace I already have with God. Amen? So, like Jesus, we get to be peacemakers. Well, that's if you vote for the right guy. No. We get to be peacemakers with whatever the situation with Christ. Peace and prosperity. Well, what do you mean by prosperity? Well, that's, that's easy. I want to prosper every way God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit wants me to prosper. By the way, God wants me to prosper. But he has a different definition than all the money you think you want or all the power you think you need or all the social connections that you've got to have. He has a different definition of true prosperity. Jesus told us that in chapter 15. Just turn the page, one page over, chapter 15. Uh, look with me at verse 4. Jesus says, you are already, or no, excuse me, he says, abide in me. Uh, he's the vine, we're the branches. Jesus says, abide, live, dwell in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Neither can you, you can't bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides, lives, dwells, remains in me. And I in him bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Look at verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Look at verse 16. You did not choose me. You didn't choose me. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Appointed you. I ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my Father's or in my name, he may give you. These commands or these things I command you that you love one another. Pastor Bill, what's prosperity? Well, you have his peace. You have the peace of Christ. Then he says, abide in me, dwell in me, live in me, remain in me, hang out with me. If you're connected to the vine, he's the vine. You're not the vine. You're just a branch. But if you're connected to the source, if you're connected to Jesus, and you abide there, stay there, live there, dwell there. Everything that you get from the vine, everything you get from Christ is going to show up on your branch. Boop. You're going to have fruit. 
You say, did I produce the fruit? You didn't produce the fruit. The fruit came from the vine. Are you tracking with me? You abide there. You abide in him. And he abides in you. It works both ways. And then we abide in his love. We just, we just hang there. We dwell there. And guess what happens? You have him. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Father. And connected to Christ, you just stay connected. You just stay focused on Jesus. You're going to have prosperity. That's my word. You're going to have fruit on your branch. And by the way, this is how God the Father is glorified. By much fruit. He wants a lot of fruit out of you. And you say, well, what is that? The fruit of the Holy Spirit is? It's love. Well, they don't deserve love. I know they don't. That's why you have to be prosperous in Jesus to love people that you don't even like. Amen. Well, I'm not going to love them until I like them. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't. You love them, and then you might like them. Did you hear me say might? <laughs> There's people I have to work on liking but I love him. 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 Well, you're just, no, I'm not a lovely guy. I'm just connected to one who is, God is love. God is love. If you're connected to God, Jesus, abiding in him, well, guess what? You'll have his peace, and then you'll have his prosperity, which is love. It's love. You say, well, what does that look like? People. It looks like people. You don't stand in front of the mirror and say, I love me, I love me, I love me, I love me. <laughs> That's a different sermon. That's a different sermon. You stand looking at your neighbors and people standing in line at Walmart. And you say, I love them. I love them. You, you watch the news and those people you don't even like on the news. You love them. You say, I can't do that. I know you can't. That's why you have to be connected to the vine. You say, I'll never like them. Don't say never. Don't say never with the Lord. And so, okay, I gave, you the, I gave you the bottom line, right? Peace and prosperity is Jesus. Connected to Jesus. And then guess what? You, you'll have so many people in your life. You'll have so much love in your life. You'll have so many things going on. You'll have people all around you. And that'll get you through life. Focused on him knowing his peace, like right now, and then seeing his prosperity in your life, fruitfulness. Have a nice day. <laughs> you say, is that the sermon? Uh-huh, that's the sermon. Oh, you want to look at the way that looks practically, emotionally, politically? You want to look at that? Yeah, you do. Why, why do we? It's in your Bible. Father, thank you. Thank you for the word of God that we, we love the word, Lord. We love its authority. We love its history. We love its details. But we recognize more than anything, it's a love letter. And Holy Spirit, we need you not only to interpret the word, but to apply the word to where we can see the glory of Jesus better from the very written word of God. So I pray the Holy Spirit to <clears throat> illuminate the Holy Spirit to bring to life the word incarnate in us individually and collectively. And not just that we know ourselves better or you better, but Lord, that actually because of the word tonight, we might be transformed more into the person of Jesus. That's, that's always the goal transformation. And that's why we come on Wednesday night. That's why we listen, not to pass a test or have more information. But Lord, that we might know the person of Jesus better and that he might be more glorified and that'll cause us to be more in love with him than ever before. And then that fruit, Lord, will be on our branch and then the people around us will be affected. And that's what I pray for. Thank you for Wednesday night. Thank you for Second Chronicles. In chapter 26, I thank you for it ahead of time. Help us to see Jesus in that chapter as we look at it carefully. And that, Lord, you'd receive all of the honor and all the glory. And all of God's people would say, Amen. we are in Second Chronicles tonight. And we're going to jump ahead to chapter 26. I think there'll be one more 
study out of Second Chronicles, and then we're going to move on to Ezra. So we're going through the Bible book by book, and so we've already preached the entire Bible. That's all online. You can find sermons from every part of the Bible. But uh, we're summarizing uh, these books and seeing how they fit together. And in Second Chronicles, there's a frustration happening throughout the book. <clears throat> and the frustration is with politics. They keep wanting to have a perfect king. They want to have a king that brings peace. And they want to have a king that brings prosperity. And can we all agree that we have that same ambition? We want a king to bring peace. And we want a king to bring prosperity. Amen? That, I mean, we all share that in common. Now, I've already told you the punchline for the sermon. We have that king. Just so you remember the punchline. You say, but we live in Amarillo. I know. I live here too. And well, we don't know how much longer we'll live here. I don't know. I'm planning for 30 years, but we'll see what God has in mind. And so while I'm here for my city and for my country, you know, I'm just a spoiled baby boomer. I am. I'll confess it. But I want peace and prosperity for my country. I want that for you. I want that for my family. I especially want it for my grandchildren. I can't imagine. My, my own children are going to have to grow up in a different economy than what I got to grow up with. I, I know that's all going to somehow hit the fan. I know it. But my grandchildren, I, I can't even do that, man. That's where I can fall back and trust the peace and the prosperity of God with all the unknowns. But I'm just sharing with you straight up at the very beginning, I still want, I mean, I'm still an American. I still have a house. I want to be able to go to Sam's and buy food. Right? So I got skin in the game. I'm not going to stick my head in the sand and say, well, it just doesn't matter anymore. It does matter. I just need to make sure on my priority scale that I don't give it more weight than it deserves. See, that's the frustration of Second Chronicles. They think they got the right guy, and then the right guy doesn't make it. We saw that last week with Asa. Tonight we get to see they've got the perfect king. They've got the perfect king. He's so great. But he doesn't make it either. Second Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 1. Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. There's some strange words there in the Bible. You probably don't notice it because we're so used to hearing it, but not in the Bible. In the Bible, we the people got Uzziah. Oh, no, wait, the kings come from whoever the daddy was, and then the next king, the son of the king, whoever the daddy was when he died, well, then his son. That's the way it works. That's the way. But with Uzziah, there's a special, and it was his dad, Azariah, that died, so he's there. But notice it says right there, now all the people of Judah. Oh, oh, in America, it would sound like we the people. See, you're already doing too much math. And you say, are you against we the people? I'm just telling you this. I'm just being straight up. You know, if you look at the majority of anything throughout the Bible, most of the time, most of the time, the majority was wrong. And so when we the people, what were the people? What did they want? They wanted great king. They want Uzziah. He's only 16. But somehow they look at him and say, well, his dad, yeah, well, we had to take his dad out because that's another whole story. You can go back and read chapter 25. But they took out the dad, so they took the son, Uzziah, 16. And I, I understand being 16. That's when I got saved. By the way, I didn't choose God. God chose me. I wasn't looking for God. God was looking for me. And I don't know if Uzziah, but anyways, he's there because of the people and also under the sovereignty of God. Right? See, we the people think that we're, you know, the sovereignty of God trumps all the we the people. It does. In case you haven't noticed, 
we the people are not in the majority at all. I'm talking about Christians. We're not. That's why it's such a great missionary opportunity, right? Now, see, I've already lost some of you guys. I can tell, and there's people out there thinking, there he goes again. I'm not going anywhere. I told you the punchline. We got Jesus, and he wants us to be prosperous for him. And so we all start the chapter the same way. We're all rooting for the new king, the new president. He just got voted in. And we all want the same thing, right? We wanted to bring prosperity and peace and success. Well, you got the right guy with Uzziah at the beginning. Now, all the people of Judah took Uzziah, he was only 16 years old. They made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Elath, Elath, restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. He reigned 52 years years in Jerusalem. Can I hear you say 52 years? years. See, that rings for me a little bit. I, this year, am celebrating my 50th year since Jesus saved me. By the way, Jesus did not make me a king. I am not King Bill. Except to Cindy. No, I just didn't. (laughs) And by the way, I wasn't appointed by anybody except my Lord. So you have to keep in mind through any government, any king, any prince, any country, anyone, anywhere, anywhere. We, the people, might think we picked them. And on the side of human responsibility, you did. But on the side of God's sovereignty, God picks every king, every prince, every country, every power, every movement, every war, every one of them. Because God is in charge. Amen? But this selfish baby boomer still wants peace and prosperity. With Jesus and with America. I do. So they've got the right guy. What do they want? Well, they want like what we want, peace and prosperity. So what's he do? Uzziah is 16 years old. He reigned 52 years. That's amazing. That's a long time for any king over Jerusalem. So obviously he was blessed. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Can I hear an amen? He's, he's off to a great start. He does what is right. Well, what did he do? He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. By the way, Amaziah was a good king until the end of his reign. He sought God. Way to go, Uzziah. Verse 5, he sought God in the days of Zechariah. Wow, Zechariah is a big prophet. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. So he's got the right prophet. He's also got Isaiah, by the way. We'll talk about that in a little bit. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosperous. There is a responsibility in grace. So God sought you. You didn't seek him. God found you. And you said yes. Thank you for saying yes. Then you have opportunities through life to keep seeking God or wasting your time as you just seek after you. Uzziah at 16, at 20, at 30, was smart enough to keep seeking God, to keep seeking God, to keep seeking God. And as long as he sought God, God prospered him. Are you tracking with me? So that's why I'm glad you guys are here tonight. Okay, we're not trying to find God to impress God so that somehow we get blessed. We're already blessed in the Lord Jesus. But as we stay in tune with the Lord Jesus, as we keep connecting ourselves to the vine. See, there's an activity going on. You're making decisions. You're abiding in him. He's abiding in you. Well, guess what? As long as you do that, you'll be fine. 
you'll be fruitful. But the moment you stop, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. You're disconnected. You're not going to have the, the juice flowing through your veins. You're not going to have the fruit. You're going to be back to me, myself, and I. I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm talking about your prosperity, the race you're running, your Wednesday today, and your Thursday tomorrow. Seeking the Lord is something we still do. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And whether you know it or not, that's why you came on Wednesday night. No, we just came. No, you're still seeking. Lord. That's a good thing. He's already found you, and he wants to find you wanting him more. Okay? You're with me, right? Okay, I haven't lost you yet. Okay, I, my plan is not to lose anybody in this sermon. That's my plan. I told you the punchline. It's Jesus. Oh, we got to have a good king. Well, you got a great one here. And so he sought the Lord. The Lord God. The Lord, God made him. By the way, he didn't make himself prosperous. God made him prosperous. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. It's right there. Verse 6. Now, Uzziah, he went out. He made war against the Philistines. Well, why are you doing that? Well, they're the old enemy of Israel and of Judah. So he just goes out there and he's going to take care of the enemy. Don't, by the way, when we have a president, don't we want a president taking care of our foes, our enemy? Can we all agree about that? Now, we might define the enemy differently, but you know what? Keep us safe. I just want to be safe. So Uzziah's going to say, okay, I'm going to take care of the Philistines. He made war against the Philistines. He broke down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jebla and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities. What? Yeah, he built cities around Ashdod and amongst the Philistines. God helped him. Can I hear you say God helped him? God helped him. By the way, that word's going to show up a couple times. <clears throat> what was the word? God. What's the other word for the Holy Spirit? Oh. Oh. The same help that Uzziah got from God is the help that we have inwardly with the Spirit of God. Oh. Oh. God helped him. Helped him do what? In war with the Philistines. He helped him build cities all around against the Philistines, against the Arabians who lived in Gerbal, and against the Menu or the Meunites. The Meunites. I could make fun of that, but anyways, he helped him with that. Also, the Ammonites brought tribute. Now they're bringing tax money to Uzziah. His fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt. Man, he's getting famous now, for he became exceedingly strong. He's not just strong, but exceedingly strong. How that? Because God made him prosperous. God helped him. And he's a builder. He's a warrior. Things are happening. Things are going up. Uh, Infrastructure, new cities here, new stuff, rubble over there. We're cleaning it up. Woo! You care about infrastructure, right? You care about new roads and new cities and however you fall on, you know, with Amarillo. I, I've lived in Amarillo now <clears throat> 42 years. That's amazing. Do you know what I love about Amarillo? It's still changing. They're still building. Now, maybe not compared to other cities that, you know, <clears throat> but traffic jams are longer in Amarillo, if you're going from my house, especially down Western, it doesn't work anymore. So anyways, but there's still, you know, people are still building. I'm still hoping Costco wants to come here. That's just selfish on my part. And uh, Cheesecake Factory would be great too. That's just being selfish on my part. And, you know, they are putting a loop around our city to catch up with Lubbock. And I'm hoping that I'll live long enough to at least drive around it once. And, you know, there are still neighborhoods going up. And so there's some things happening. Have, have you been to any of these other little towns where nothing's happening? And it's the same thing as it was 40 years ago? Or a town that used to be there is not there anymore? I'm glad that Uzziah was used by God to build some stuff, to make progress, to renovate. Can I hear an amen? amen? And selfishly, I hope that continues for Amarillo. I hope it continues for Texas. I hope 
It continues for America. I'm still waiting for a bullet train to show up. <laughs> you say, what? You know, Europe got them like 30 years ago. Hey, 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 hey. Japan's got them. That'd be pretty sweet. Just, just saying. Don't, don't you want that? I mean, safety, enemies, rebuilding some stuff. It's okay to say yes. God made him exceedingly strong. Verse 9, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem. What kind of towers? At the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the corner buttress of the wall. Then he fortified them. He built, they're actually warfare towers to where, you know, you would be able to shoot at the enemy and see who's coming, all that kind. He built towers everywhere. He also built, uh, also he built towers. Those are radio antennas in the desert. That's radio by grace. I'm just making application. He made towers. I was disappointed that Tim didn't say amen louder than he did. Because like, what's, what's he doing? What's he doing? He's a builder. He's a warrior. He's thinking outside the box. So right with Jerusalem, he's putting up special fortification uh, out in the middle of nowhere. nowhere. He's got other watchtowers going on. He's thinking ahead. He, he's a very great king. He's what they wanted. Matter of fact, he's thinking so far out of the box. Uh, not only did he fortify, he built towers out in the desert. He dug many wells. Uh, amen, the Ogallala Reservoir. He's tapping in. That's another joke that you guys ought to kind of get. You, you realize if we didn't have the Ogallala, you wouldn't be able to water your yard anymore. Because it's just, so amen for that thing that goes all the way up, you know, to like North Dakota. Um, Amen. So he's, he's making fortresses. He's got towers. He's going to war. He's rebuilding, And he's digging wells. So you want water. Do you guys still remember when Boone Pickens wanted to sell all our water down to Dallas? That's another sermon. But anyways, <laughs> I'm glad I can still... My water bill's gone up, but I'm glad I got water. So, hey, way to go, Uzziah. You got many wells. For he had much livestock. He's a rancher. He's thinking about all his people. He had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. Well, there we are again. Way to go, Uzziah. You're digging wells. You got livestock. You're fortifying the whole country. He also had farmers. That's when Chris Hodge should say amen. Can I hear an amen from Chris? He's back there. He's afraid to say amen. He's a farmer right there, right in the Bible, right there from 2 Chronicles. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. Can I hear an amen? amen. I mean, this guy is like what you want for a king. Vineyards, cattle, Carmel, the plains. Digging wells, building towers. They know about us in Egypt. Yeah. And you need to know the people thought that. That's what they wanted. Yeah. He's 15 or 16. Now he's 26. Now he's 36. Yeah. What will he do next? Moreover. Moreover. Yeah. Moreover. Uzziah had an army of fighting men. Oh, he's a man's man. Oh, yeah. Who went out to war by companies. It's all in order. According to the number of their role, as prepared by Yael the scribe, and Messiah the officer, under the hand of Ananiah, one of the king's captains. The total number of the chief officers of the mighty men of valor was 2,600. And under their authority was an army of 307,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. He had 307,500 men underneath all the roll, all ready to march. 
Then Uzziah prepared for them, all 307,500. He prepared for them, for the entire army, shields, spears, helmets, body armor, Kevlar, bows, slings, Colt 45s, some Rugers, Glocks, to cast stones. Did I miss anything in that? I didn't think until I was reading it. Guess what? They're happy. We got water. We got beef. Barbecue on Carmel. <laughs> we know where we fit. And we all look really good in new uniforms and shields and glocks. <laughs> Any questions? They know about us in Egypt because we're building towers everywhere. What a great king we have. This is the country we always hoped for. This is the country we live. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be an Israelite under King Uzziah. Long live the king. Can you feel it? And it was a real feeling. I don't think it was coincidental that somebody today asked me a question. Nobody's asked me this question in a long time. But somebody today, today, is out of the blue, asked me this question. In your lifetime, how many presidents do you think were Christians? Can we define Christian? Now, I didn't get hung up on it. I didn't get hung up on it. But nobody's asked me that question in a long time. And I said, well, you know, somebody said, and this one said, but now I don't know. This one might have been, didn't act that way, but not, might have, could have, you know. So. Then the same person asked me today. Which one in my lifetime was I most disappointed with as a president? Well, now let me give you a list. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want me to answer that as a citizen? Or as somebody that has a perfect king? I did share with him, because it's a very brief conversation. I did share with him, for me, the one I was the most disappointed with in my life. And then in the next breath, I said, he was the one that was the hardest for me to honor. Because my evaluation of whoever in my lifetime is one thing. My responsibility to honor every one of them, biblically. Did I pass that test with God every time? Nope. I remember one time on an election, I was sure, I was sure the stars had fallen from heaven. <laughs> and I still remember walking outside in my yard and looking up and basically saying, God, you've got to be kidding. That's decades ago. And I learned a lesson decades ago. God makes decisions. And it's easy. It's easy. Isn't it easy when all of a sudden we got the right military, we got the right beef, we got the right equipment, and everybody's proud of their country, and water's coming out of the wells, and towers are everywhere, and they know us even in Egypt. King Uzziah, way to go. I knew you guys would do this. <laughs> That's why I gave you the punchline. Aren't you glad we have Jesus? Yes. Amen. So, 
He has all the military. They have all the equipment. And not only do they have all the equipment, verse 15, it says is extra. This is extra. This is like over the top. In verse 15, he made, Uzziah made devices in Jerusalem, invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. What? Uzziah, the Jew, the Israelite, is an inventor with other skilled inventors. They, they invented the catapults. Did you know that? Those are war machines before anybody else knew about war machines. By the way, sometime, I don't have time tonight. Sometime you ought to do a study on inventors and put in Jew or put it in uh, Israel. Uh, more invention, Nobel Peace Prize, I mean, more stuff, your cell phone, all kinds of stuff has come out of Israel. But the catapult, and when you go back to this age, if you, nobody had a catapult until all of a sudden, <laughs> you say that, look at what I can do. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Who came up with that idea? Wow, we were bragging on you before, but like you can nuke them till they glow. Look, whoa, boom. That's amazing. Because notice what your Bible says. Uh, so his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped. Can I hear you say helped again? Where'd you get that idea for catapults? He got it from God, who helped him. He marvelously was helped. Until he became strong. Just to back that up one little bit, Clark says it this way. The very, this is the very first example on record of any warlike engines for the attack or defense of besieged places. And this account is long prior to anything of the kind amongst either the Greeks or the Romans. The Jews alone were the inventors of such engines, war machines, and the invention took place in the reign of Uzziah, about 800 years before the Christian era. It's no wonder that in the consequence of all this, his name spread far and, beyond, or far and abroad and struck terror into his enemies. You got what? We got catapults. We got towers. We got battering rams. We got it. We got a great king. Verse 16, the key word to the whole story, the whole chapter, key word. But. No, we're on a roll. He's been there three or four decades. I mean, this, this guy's unbelievable. We want him to live forever and be our king. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. What? What? He was so successful, he became proud. He was so strong that his heart, you know, it's interesting. Morgan says that Uzziah was not content with the authority God had already given him. Uzziah was not content with the authority. What was his authority? To be king. What was his authority? War machines, wells, cattle, vineyards, building infrastructure. He was king. But he wasn't satisfied being king. He also wanted to be a priest. Well, you're not a priest. You're a king. But the success went to his head, or now he wants to be a priest. Well, by the way, that's contrary to Exodus chapter 30. And there's only one who's prophet, priest, and king. That's Jesus. Nobody else gets to be prophet, priest, and king. Unless somehow it goes to your head that you think you're so big and bad that you can now be a priest. You can't be a priest. 
You're not of the tribe of Aaron. So notice what he does. But when he was strong in his heart, his heart was lived up to his destruction. What he's going to do here is going to destroy him to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering, no, Uzziah, no, by entering the temple, no, of the Lord to burn incense. Uzziah, you're the king, you're not a priest. On the altar of incense, Uzziah, no. Who's going to stop me? So Azariah, the priest, was too afraid of this great president, this great king. It doesn't say that, does it? Azariah, the priest, went in after him. You're talking about the most successful king that these people had ever seen. And he's been there 30 or 40 years. And so now what's he doing? Somebody's got to stop him. He's a king. He's not a priest. Somebody has to tell him the truth where he is. He's right in the middle of the tabernacle. He's right in the middle of the temple. He's right in the middle of the sanctuary. He's right in the middle of church. So Azariah the priest went after him, and with him there was 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. You bet they're valiant men. This took courage for a confrontation with this greatest king up to right in their lifetime anyways. And they withstood King Uzziah. They withstood him. And they said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord. You're out of place. It's not your gift. What are you doing? Uzziah. You're breaking the commands of the Lord. Uzziah. This isn't your gift. Uzziah, you're the king. Uzziah, you can't burn incense. Uzziah, you're not a son of Aaron. Uzziah, stop, stop. And valiant men, valiant priests, Azariah being one of them, did what hardly anybody does. When you see people in sin, what's our responsibility? To talk to them, to tell them. Matthew 18. You guys are getting all down in the mouth again on me. Remember, who's our peace? Who's our prosperity? And what did he leave us here? He left us here to know what we've been gifted to do. Did you know that? By the Holy Spirit. And so you be the greatest king. If he's called you to be king, you be the king of what you've been called to be. If you're a priest, then you be a priest. I'm using those words. If you're a pastor, if you're a teacher, if you're a leader, if you're a servant, if you're a greeter, you be the greatest one you can be. But please don't step into somebody else's authority when you haven't got the authority to do it. Did that just make sense? Did that make sense to you? Well, I'm just going to tell them what I think. Well, before you tell them what you think, you might not have the authority to tell them what you think. God knows how to take care of his priests and his king and his prophets, right? So if you run in your lane, you'll be fine. It's when you want to run in somebody else's lane, you're going to get messed up. And so when you're running in somebody else's lane, that's when it's really great to have priests, pastors, teachers, sisters, brothers around you saying, stop. Then Uzziah, verse 19, repented to his... Well, that's what it should say. I mean, if we're writing a beautiful fairy tale here story, the greatest king about to mess up repented, right? He fell on his face, confessed his sin, gave the censor back to Azariah and said, you're right, I'll crawl out of here and hopefully God won't strike me dead. He didn't do that. By the way, most people don't do that either. When they get in the wrong lane and you try to tell them, then you, uh, Uzziah became furious. Can I hear you say Furious. That's a word. He got really mad. Enraged is what it says in the Hebrew. And he had a censure. He had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was furious, angry, enraged, the Hebrew word is repeated twice. He's enraged. He's furious. His head is full of pride and fury. And while he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead. 
before the priests in the house of the Lord, beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him. And there on his forehead, he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. What just happened? You had a famous great king. Pride went to his heart. And he decided he'd be a priest. And God said, no, you won't. And God warned him through Azariah. And all he did was get mad, really mad. And before their eyes. And you say, why the forehead? Well, it probably is all over his body, but they're looking right at his forehead. And there it just leprosy starts growing. Like, you think COVID's bad? Leprosy. Leprosy is dead man walking. When you've got leprosy, it's over. Everything's over. Everything's over. Everything's over. And now he wants to get out. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now, the rest of the acts of Uzziah, from the first to the last, the prophet Isaiah. Can I hear you say Isaiah? We saw Zechariah earlier. Now he's got Isaiah, the son of Amos, wrote. So Uzziah rested with his fathers. They buried him with his fathers in the field of burial, which belongs to the king, belonged to the kings. For they said, he is a leper. Then Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. The greatest king going died as a leper. It's ugly. Do you know how the people felt? Do you know how Isaiah felt? you know how Zechariah felt? You know what it's like when all of a sudden, whoever you vote for and you're thinking, yes, yes, and they did some things right, yes, yes, and then all of a sudden you say, what? 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 Now multiply that by a hundred times. He's a leper. What was the big problem that he had? Contentment. Had everything going for him until you wanted more and more and more. Can I see the verse out of Philippians chapter 4? Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned, I've learned, this is something we have to learn in whatever state I am to be content. This is the Apostle Paul. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And the verse we love to quote, make sure you know the context of the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does that mean? I can be content whether there's food in my belly or no food in my belly, money in my wallet or no money in my wallet, whether I'm in jail or out of jail. Whether I'm going to heaven or i got another 20 years to live, I have learned, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned how to be content. And not trying to find another lane or somebody else's ministry or some other gimmick. Nope, I have learned how to be content. I can do all things. I can be content in any circumstance with the hand of God. That's what that verse means. Can I hear an amen? Uzziah didn't get it. If you can imagine the country and the people and how they felt, and so the great Uzziah that built all this stuff died a leper, died embarrassed, died in judgment, died it's over. And that disappointment, look at Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah's reference there. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah picks up on that. He was alive during Uzziah's reign. Look at Isaiah chapter 1, uh, page 830. 830. Just want to show you the very first verse of the book of Isaiah. Can I hear an amen for the book of Isaiah? I, I love Isaiah. Yes, Isaiah. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah. See, it doesn't say King Uzziah. Did you notice he doesn't say King Uzziah? It's just in the days of Uzziah. So when Isaiah started his ministry, when Isaiah started what he's recording here, Uzziah was still on the throne, right? 
until you get to chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Isaiah writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, how do you think that felt? What, you think that's just a calendar in your Bible? Like a reference so we know when this vision happens? Oh, it is a reference. But when you study Uzziah and how great he was and then how far he fell and a leper and you're Isaiah and that's your city, that's your kingdom, that's your country, that was your king. Can I tell you, Isaiah feels just like you feel when the vote doesn't go your way, when all of a sudden it's going down the tubes, when it looks like the whole country, the world's got leprosy. We were on such a roll. I thought they would... Bunch of COVID, a bunch of isolation, a bunch of nobodies that knows what's going on. You want to know how Isaiah felt? Aren't you glad he didn't quit the ministry? You know this chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. One cried to the other saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, woe is me, for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king, the king, the Lord of hosts. You know who is the answer to your political problem, right? Everything's going south. I can't believe it. You know who is king, right? Well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, I'm glad you asked, Isaiah. Jump down to verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go, tell this people. What? This is horrible, Lord. It's the worst political climate in decades. In his, what do you want me to tell them? Why didn't you tell them the Christmas story? What? Yeah, turn to chapter 9. Just tell them the Christmas story. You want me to tell them what? Well, just get to chapter 9, verse 6. You know this story. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The